From beyond the screen of bushes which surrounded the spring, Popeye watched the man drinking. A faint path led from the road to the spring. Popeye watched the man, a tall, thin man, hatless, in worn gray flannel trousers and carrying a tweed coat over his arm, emerge from the path and kneel to drink from the spring. The spring welled up at the root of a beech tree and flowed away upon a bottom of whirled and waved sand. It was surrounded by a thick growth of cane and briar, of cypress and gum, in which broken sunlight lay sourceless. Somewhere hidden and secret yet near, a bird sang three notes and ceased. In the spring, the drinking man leaned his face to the broken and myriad reflection of his own drinking. When he rose up, he saw among them the shattered reflection of Popeye's straw hat though he had heard no sound. He saw, facing him across the spring, a man of undersize, his hands in his coat pocket, a cigarette slanted from his chin. His suit was black, with a tight, high-waisted coat. His trousers were rolled once, and caked with mud above mud-caked shoes. His face had a queer, bloodless color, as though seen by electric light. Against the sunny silence in his slanted straw hat and his slightly akimbo arms, he had that vicious, depthless quality of stamped tin. Opening scenes when they're inspired are spellbinders. My other great favorite is the one where we first make acquaintance with what I think is the real protagonist of Bleak House, the pea super the London Fog. Opening lines, for me, exert the same seductive power. Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in a church where a wedding has been. Or, my love, she speaks like silence, without ideals or violence. She doesn't have to say she's faithful, yet she's true, like ice, like fire. How did I come to be a person given over entirely to books? Reflecting on the question for this occasion yields the following possible narrative. In primary school, to my mild surprise, I came top of the class with boring frequency. <laughs> Surprised, because my mind then was mostly on something other than the scholastic, that of being a tomboy. If you're not a boy, and you can see they're having a lot more fun than you, then that's the next best thing. So while being a clever girl pleased my sense of competitiveness, it was really no big deal. The big deal was really, especially in retrospect, the prize I received each year for being top girl. And they were large format hardback 
girls' own annuals. <laughs> Books whose only illustration was on the cover. Inside, the contents were words depicting the genteel adventures of rosy-cheeked English girls. After careful inspection of what my counterparts were wearing on that other planet, which, unlike the tropics where I was living, seemed to veer from warm to cold to snow, which were all very strange concepts to someone knowing only very intense heat. However, I read these stories with increasing relish. Outgrowing them came as my knowledge of English expanded. If pressed, one could say those books, those girls' own annuals, changed my life. The mists, or should I be calling them the fog of time, have obscured how it came to pass, but I found myself graduating from those books to Agatha Christie. Secondary school, through a subject called English literature, led to the discovery of the wondrous worlds of Hardy, the Brontes, Dickens, Lawrence, and Shakespeare. My teachers, ladies of leisure mostly, who didn't need the work, but did it for love, and that made the difference. They were hero-worshipped by me. That faraway, entranced look in their faces when they were teaching the subject was noted probably only by me, prompted by an overactive imagination. I admired and was even envious of their intimate familiarity with the magical realm of the written word. The yearning to one day soon be like them was ardently felt. My terminal attachment to the world of literature thus has very modest beginnings indeed. And unlike Adrian Mole, I didn't feel like an intellectual and certainly didn't finish War and Peace in one night. <laughs> Instead, I was half conscious of entering a solitary world where one communed personally and very intimately with people through their written words. The imagination was given free reign in this interior life one naturally developed. Agatha Christie to modernism sounds like an epic leap, but it wasn't. The two, after all, coexisted in the same historical time. Because its appeal was immediate for me, modernism, especially the American expression of it, felt like a natural progression. And it all began on a visit to Halston Local Library in London on my first foray abroad. The F shelf was the first one I encountered, and there, arrayed before me, was the entire Chateau and Windows collection of William Faulkner, that gentleman from Oxford, Mississippi. He wasn't, at that point, someone I'd heard of, even if I prided myself on being reasonably well-read. I left with the sound and the fury. Anything with the bard's words in its title must be okay. Slowly, as I went on to read everything on that library shelf marked William Faulkner, I felt myself mesmerized. His world became my world. I had found not a book, but a writer to whom my devotion became complete. 
in transposing his postage stamp size corner of the South to the universal, Faulkner invented a place alive with characters and narratives that depict the comedy and tragedy of being human at the mercy of history and the heart. All is rendered in an uncompromising stylistic language, not for the faint-hearted or the commitment shy. Looking back, it's nothing short of miraculous that as a novice to Faulkner, I made it past the opening Benji section of The Sound and the Fury. My introduction to the great man was definitely a trial by fire. And those of you who've read the book, you know the Benji section, don't you? The trial by fire led me to not just reading his whole body of work, but to reading it over and over again over the course of my life. He's so much now within me that I just had to do what devotees everywhere feel compelled to do, which is make the pilgrimage to the place where the creation took place, to Oxford, Mississippi, which I went about four years ago. But that's another story for another time. Ethan Hawke once said, when he was preparing to play Macbeth, that saying Shakespeare's words aloud is like having a spell cast on one. I stand before you as one eternally, inescapably, fatally spellbound. Thank you.